Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the third lecture of Marxism. As I have already introduced myself, I am Arindam Ghosh, an assistant professor in the Department of English, Krishna Chandra College, Hetampur Birbhum. And today uh, I will talk about uh, the alienation effect, the effect of the alienation on the laborers, as uh, Marx uh, talked about in his uh, Capital and of course in the Communist Manifesto to some extent. But before that, let us recapitulate a bit about uh, what I have taught you in the two previous lectures. In the two previous lectures, I have introduced you about the general definition and scope of Marxism. What is Marxism? That it's a social and political and economic philosophy introduced by Karl Marx, which examines the impact on the capitalism, on the general economic development, and uh, specifically on the workers' people, on the proletariat people, those who don't have any form of economic power and don't have any control over the means of production, but those who are actually the forces of production. I've talked about that Marxism actually ends with the dream of a workers' revolution, a revolution of the workers and at the same time uh, uh, with the dream of communism, a uh, classless and stateless society. I have introduced at the same time with the figure of the Karl Heinrich Marx, how he is an important figure from the mid 19th century Europe, how he changed the entire political history of the Europe after uh, 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 1900 and how his philosophy become a very important tool uh, for realizing and actualizing revolution. I uh, told you about that. Marx become a tool in overthrowing the major most uh, regimes uh, of Europe and uh, his philosophy is not only something to be, uh, to, to, to be read but to be applied. It's actually a practical form of political philosophy. I have also introduced you with the figure of the Friedrich Engels, uh, how Capital and Communist Manifesto are the two very important books uh, uh, that uh, contributed a lot in the, uh, uh, in the European political philosophy. And at the same time, I've discussed you, with you regarding the various uh, origin points of Marxist philosophy. What are the sources of Marxist philosophy? Specifically, three important sources. One is the German idealism, the philosophy of G.W.F. Hegel, Immanuel Kant, of course, the British political economy of Adam Smith and David Ricardo, and uh, Lenin has identified another important very source, that is the French revolutionary writings writings of the French socialists like Trudeau, uh, uh, like Saint Simon and others. I have introduced you with the conception of the economic base and uh, the cultural superstructure with the conception of the means of production and of course relations of production. I have introduced you with the conception of the historical materialism which talks about the materialist interpretation of history how history should be seen in terms of the matter, in terms of the money, in terms of the economic dominance and not in terms of some abstract ideas. So Marxism in that sense is a complete departure and radical rejection of the idealist way of thought or idealist way of reading history. At the same time, uh, I've also introduced you with the conception of the dialectical materialism. What is dialectical materialism? It's a sort of conflict between two ideas, between thesis and antithesis. And with the resolution of this conflict, uh, they are born the conception of the synthesis. When the tension gets resolved, Marx has derived actually this thinking from Hegel's uh, dialectism. And uh, I must... Uh, I must tell you that the term dialectical materialism was first coined by Joseph Dietzen, D I E T Z G, and not by Karl Marx. Uh, I have discussed with you Marx's view on religion and, of course, very important, the stages of historical development. How our society developed from the primitive communism down to a slave society to feudalism to capitalism. And Marx says that there lies a, a, a form of innate contradictions in each of these historical stages that has led to the next stage. 
So from primitive communism, we have developed into the slave society, the Greco-Roman civilization, then into the feudalism, and at last, into the capitalism. And Marx said that human history had therefore been a long struggle between the oppressed and the oppressor. Marx always talked about this conception of the class struggle uh, in his uh, uh, description of the historical stages. I have discussed with you the difference between the socialism and the communism. According to Marx, communism is the ultimate form of uh, dream society. Communism is a thing for which we should strive for, but socialism is actually a transitory age between uh, the capitalism and the communism. Because in socialism, actually suggests that contribution is made from everyone according to their ability, but they get back according to their size of contribution. Where in communism, everyone in society contributes and works according to their ability and gets back according to their need. So communism is a, a, almost a dream society, a classless society. I don't know whether uh, uh, it, it, it's possible ever to actualize uh, this form of society in this world. Uh, many have tried, uh, many governments have failed, uh, revolutions occurred uh, in the name of communism. But till now, till uh, 2020, uh, an ideal form of communism perhaps uh, uh, never been achieved because according to Marx, a communist society would be a classless and at the same time a stateless society. Con the conception of communism was always international. So another very important thing is Marx's critique of capitalism. Marx was a virulent critic of the capitalism. At the same time, he also praises capitalism because of its uh, technological innovations, introducing a steam engine, introducing railroad and other forms of facilities in the contemporary Europe. But at the same time, he said that uh, it is responsible for all forms of inequality in the society. It is exploitative, it is alienating, undemocratic, irrational, environmentally destructive, and it's prone to war. So moving on to that, uh, today I will teach you regarding the theory of alienation. What is alienation? Uh, let us begin. According to Marx, alienation occurs when these laborers, specifically the industrial proletariat, actually becomes a mechanistic part of a social class. And this mechanistic part, this complete alienation from the product that he is producing is the condition which estranges the person from their humanity. So according to Marx, uh, suppose in a capitalistic society, a person, uh, a laborer, an industrial laborer, those who are doing a, 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 a single kind of job, a monotonous job, he is doing the job day in and day out. So, for example, if you are a laborer in an industry, you are uh, tightening a particular screw day in and day out, and we are, you, you are doing only that thing. So, you are becoming a specialized perhaps in tightening the screw, but you never feel yourself to be a, a, a part of the entire whole of the product. So, this form of uh, estrangement occurs in the mindscape of the laborers. And hence, Marx introduced the theory of the alienation. In this theory of alienation, he describes that the estrangement, Marx terms it as enfremdum effect. Estrangement of people from the aspects of their species essence as a consequence of living in a society of stratified social class. So what's his uh, species essence? His species essence is of course humanity. So these forms of mechanical jobs actually estrange a person. Taketar nijer je self, taki nijer manobota, tar je nijer manus hoye otha. Shikhan taki ei aki thoron er bar bar monotonous job, ei aki thoron er kaj diner por din dore kore, taki ata machine er part korte uche. Ata Marx bollo the theory of alienation, and he said that under capitalism, the fruits of the production belong to the employers, those who employ these laborer classes, who expropriate the surplus created by the others and so generate their alienated laborers. I have already talked with you the conception of the 
surplus value in capitalism what is surplus value surplus value is a is is specifically the value of the laborer the wages given by the industrialist to the laborer minus uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 price in which the product is being sold in the market so basically it is the profit the surplus value is the profit of the capitalist uh, industrial classes those who are making profit from this production so uh, and marx says that uh, many of the industrialists aim and objective is only to maximize their profit and there occurs the alienation in the mindscape of these laborers so marx according to the marxian formula capitalism is equal to class conflict because because it eventually generates kind of hatred uh, in the mind of the proletariat industrial proletariat and the proletariats for uh, the bourgeois people for those who are controlling the means of the production land labor capital and organization and they are uh, in the process of this exploitation they are also alienated from the process of the labor and finally workers are alienated from themselves so labor itself is reduced to a mere commodity and work becomes a depersonalized activity no more uh, uh, work is no more a way of expressing yourself no more a way of gaining pleasure from the work rather the work becomes a way of uh, monotonousness and instead of a creative and fulfilling one and hence there occurs uh, 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 the question of the class conflict in the mind of those uh, who are proletariat these are some of the visual representation of the capitalism and exploitation uh, portrayed by a new york artist in the 1930s and here we come into a very important theory of marxism that is a marxian class theory so marx distinguishes social classes on the basis of the two criteria one is that of the ownership of the means of the production those who are the owners of the capitalistic properties those who control the labor power of the others and there are of course others who sell their labor only those who don't have any kind of control over these means of the production but those are those who are basically the forces of the production the the proletariat class according to marx is the most important component uh, in this entire product chain productive chain system in which they are actually basically the forces of production they are producing the commodities and the object but the uh, the uh, the bourgeois class is only enjoying the profit of these productions তাহলে এই সর্বহারা অর্থাৎ যারা প্রলেতারিয়ের তারা কেবলমাত্র উৎপাদন করে কেবলমাত্র ফসল উৎপাদন করে ইন্ডাস্ট্রিতে কাজ করে এগ্রিকালচারাল সেক্টরে কাজ করে কিন্তু এরা কোনোদিনই সেই ফসলের উদ্বৃত্ত যে মূল্য তার যে সঠিক মূল্য তার যে পরিশ্রমের মূল্য তার যে লেবারের যে ভ্যালু সেটা কোনোদিনই পায় না এই পুরো সারপ্লাস ভ্যালু এবং প্রফিটটা এনজয় করে দোজ হু আর বেসিক্যালি বুর্জো এখানে মার্কসের সব থেকে বেসিক ইকোনমিক প্রশ্ন মার্কস ছুঁয়ে দিয়েছেন তোমরা যদি ইফ ইউ ভিজুয়ালাইজ দিস পিকচার ইউ উইল সি দ্যাট দিস ইজ দ্য পিরামিড অফ দ্য ক্যাপিটালিস্ট সিস্টেম অ্যান্ড ইট ভিজুয়ালাইজ ইজ এস দ্য ক্লাস কনফ্লিক্ট দিজ আর দ্য পিপল অ্যাট দ্য এক্সট্রিম লোয়ার স্প্র্যাটম অফ দিস পার্টিকুলার পিকচার আর দোজ হু আর পুলিটারি those who are the forces of production the laborers in the factories those who don't control uh, the means of the production and these people they eat for you they shoot for you they are the army man uh, and the soldiers we fool you they are the religious leaders and they are the king uh, 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 the executive persons those who are controlling the entire society the administrators and the others so in this particular pyramid of the capitalist system we can clearly visualize that who are being constantly exploited so according to marx proletariat please note the spelling of the word proletariat p r o l e t a r i a t proletariat 
So proletariat is the class of the modern wage laborers who having no means of production of their own and are reduced to selling their labor power in order to live because there are no other options left for them and the capitalist mode of production establishes the conditions enabling the bourgeois to exploit these proletariat because workers labor generates a surplus value greater than the workers wages so the thing that he is producing will be uh, sell in the market in a very higher price and here lies the innate contradiction of capitalist system so uh, there is uh, the the uh, the proletariat at the very bottom of the uh, uh, entire marxian class system and then there is bourgeois uh, those who own the means of production and buy labor from the proletariat thus exploiting the proletariat they subdivide as bourgeois and petty bourgeois who are the petty bourgeois are those who work and can afford to buy little labor power that is small businessman peasant landlords trade workers they are petty bourgeois uh, whom we can call uh, the middle class and the like so marxism predicts that the continual reinvention of the means of the production eventually would destroy these petty bourgeois people degrading them from the middle class to the proletariat because of the rise of this bourgeois people so marxist theory uh, is also targeted towards these petty bourgeois people that they will eventually also participate in the proletariat revolution and then there is a lumpen proletariat who are the lumpen proletariat the outcasts of the society such as the criminals the vagabonds the beggars the prostitutes without any political sense or their class consciousness according to their marxist theory class consciousness is a very significant uh, political tool because without class consciousness the proletarians will never be able to organize a revolution jodi amar srenir chetona amar moddhe toiri na hoy tale ami biblob korte parbo na etai kintu classical marxism bole classical marxism bole the most important prerogative of organizing a revolution is your class consciousness so that you can organize a successful revolution ekta shofol biblob korte gele class consciousness dorkar etai porobortikale lenin mao shetung and other some of the uh, famous virulent political leaders uh, they actually uh, they sell this form of uh, discourse tara ei discourse ke bikri koreche ebong ei discourse ke successfully actualize koreche bibhinno jaygay class consciousness so having no interest in international or national or any form of economic affairs marx called that these lupin proletariat this specific subdivision of the proletariat would play no part in the eventual social revolution and marx also talked about other social classes like the landlords which is a historically important social class who retain some wealth and power those who have land in their Uh, 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 in their uh, 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 under under their aggies, and of course there are peasantry and farmers, uh, a scattered class incapable of organizing and affecting the social economic change. So, according to the Marxian class theory, the proletariat, and specifically those who are industrial proletariat, would eventually uh, organize the revolution. so according to marx the proletariat will play perhaps the most important part in uh, organizing the social revolution proletariat so moving on to the next slide uh, where i describe the difference between the bourgeois and the proletariat uh, can come in the five marx question who is a bourgeois uh, please uh, remember the spelling of the word bourgeois b o u r g o i s i e b o u r g o i s i e bourgeois proletariat p r o l e t r a uh, l e t uh, a r i a t proletariat so who is a bourgeois bourgeois a bourgeois refers to the capitalists who owns the means of production and most of the wealth in society on the other hand a proletariat refers to the wage earners the industrial laborers who do not have do not own who 
do not own the means of the production. So bourgeois owns the means of the production and proletariat does not own the means of the production. They have to survive only by selling their labor power. So the aim of the bourgeois is to exploit the proletariat and make massive profit. While on the other hand, the proletariat people being exploited by the bourgeois and generally earn a minimum wage live in poverty. Marx's ultimate aim was that uh, his conception of the historical materialism says that eventually the history will progress into the dictatorship of the proletariat. Shorboharar aknayokotto. যাদের হাতে কিছু নেই তারা একদিন হয়তো অস্ত্র তুলে নেবে হাতে অথবা বিপ্লব করবে যে বিপ্লবের মাধ্যমে এই সমস্ত মিনস অফ প্রোডাকশান একদিন তারা ছিনিয়ে নেবে এবং একটা কমিউনিস্ট সোসাইটি তারা এস্টাবলিশ করবে রিমেম্বার বিফোর কাল মার্কস বিফোর এইটিন ফর্টি ফোর এইটিন ফর্টি সিক্স দ্য মিড নাইনটিন সেঞ্চুরি নো থিঙ্কার এভার অন দিস ফেস অফ দ্য আর্থ হ্যাভ থট অ্যাবাউট দিস ফর্ম অফ রেভলিউশন অ্যান্ড ইন দিস সেন্স Karl Marx was really a game changer, a revolutionary thinker, as I am already constantly telling you that Marx is not only a philosopher, but he is also an applier. And he is at the same time, uh, for, uh, uh, Marxist theory is not to be read in the classroom. It is, it is for the actual political application. And it has been applied in, in, in various forms throughout the entire world. Uh, in various subverted and sometimes inverted and distorted forms. Marxism has been misinterpreted by many regimes have been th thrown in the name of the Marxism, but ultimately it transformed itself into a form of dictatorship. Kebal matro shata akna tantrati parinata hoche pada bukti kale, shata Lenin e rashi hao na keno, but of course Stalin e rashi hao na keno, but Fidel Castro e Cuba hao na keno. So, uh, so Marxism has been uh, misinterpreted by various leaders, but Marx's ultimate aim was the dictatorship of the proletariat, so that the proletariat, the forces of the production, will one day seize these means of the production, like land, labor, capital, and organization, and will ultimately lead to the abolition of the state machinery, abolition of the classes in the society. So this was Marx's dream. These are some of the pictures uh, which showcases the vengeance of the proletariat. Sharbuharar je bhayonkar raak, that is je proti hingsha. Realize hoye shiro iti hashe patate. This is a picture of the farmer confronting the landlord during Mao Zedong's mass purging of the landlords. There are those who are those who are owning the land. That is ke samaj theke bitari to kora. আস্তে আস্তে এই ল্যান্ড লর্ডের সিস্টেমটাকে শেষ হয়ে যাওয়া চীন দেখেছে রাশিয়া দেখেছে দ্য ট্রাক ড্রাইভার্স ফাইট দ্য পুলিশ ইন দ্য কোর্স অফ দ্য মিনিয়া পলিস টিম সুটেড টিম স্টার স্ট্রাইক ইন নাইনটিন সো ভেঞ্জেন্স অফ দ্য প্রোলেটারিয়েট অকেড উইচ অ্যাকচুয়ালি উই ক্যান সে দ্যাট মার্কসেস ড্রিম অফ দ্য রেভলিউশন কামস ট্রু টু সাম এক্সটেন্ট বাট always in a distorted and subverted form. So Marx talks about the class consciousness. These are uh, quite important Marxian concepts uh, in order to understand the historical materialism and dialectical materialism and Marx's theory of the criticism of the capitalism. So according to Marx, class consciousness is necessary. Uh, in order to organize and eventually uh, uh, making successful a revolution. According to Marx, ideology is very important. Though Marx uh, uh, never defined the word ideology, he used the term to describe the production of the images of the social reality. And Engels explained that ideology is basically a process accomplished by the so-called thinker consciously. It is true, but with a false consciousness. Sometimes ideology can also be misinterpreted. Ideology can also be uh, intrude inside your brain, uh, can, can be injected inside your brain by the capitalist society. So the word ideology has been uh, interpreted in different ways. Uh, later, of course, 
Foucault and Al Kuser interpreted ideology in different ways. We will discuss about these things later. But Marx and Engels used ideology in, in, in the pejorative sense. And Marx talked about the conception of the ideology in the German ideology. And he says the ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch the ruling ideas. As for example, the class which is the ruling material force of society is at the same time its ruling intellectual force. So Marx says the ruling intellectual force always created these forms of ideology in order to wash the brains of the proletariat people. So Mogoj Dholayir at the part Marx ideology Of course, Althusser, Gramsci, Foucault have also seen ideology uh, in, the, in a different context and they have interpreted the importance of ideology later. We will see the importance of ideology in the, later in the Western Marxism and of course in the post-Marxist thinking. But classical Marxism, which was popular around 1950s, 1960s, uh, classical Marxism, Orthodox Marxism changed uh, Leninism. Leninism, Marxism, Leninism was a term coined uh, around 1930s, 1940s, created by Stalin. Later, uh, uh, this, the term Stalinism was created, uh, Maoism was another philosophy. But uh, age constant change in the Marxist doctrine, the Marxist doctrine is a very relevant figure. And uh, Marx talks about the common ownership of the means of the production, the profit motive is eliminated through this common ownership and the motive of furthering the human flourishing will be introduced through this uh, conception of the common ownership. communist important uh, premise the doctrine the foundational premise of check a common ownership so as i've already discussed that uh, the main aim of the marxism the most important prediction of the marxism was that capitalism destined to be overthrown by the proletarian revolution but there is an irony marx predicted that only the industrial proletariat will put a very important uh, we play a very important part in this proletarian revolution. But the revolutions that occurred in Russia, whether it be it February Revolution or October Revolution, the revolution that occurred in China, these revolutions have been organized not by the industrial proletariat, but by the agrarian people, those who are only uh, belong to the agricultural society because Russia and China was predominantly uh, 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 were agricultural societies. So, uh, Marx's prediction of the industrial proletariat organizing the revolution never realized, uh, though Marx said that uh, ultimately it will eventually first occur in the Western Europe, but uh, it never occurred uh, in the form of the revolution in the Western Europe. So, uh, these are some of the visuals of the exploitation and the suffering of the laborers. So, the Marxist conception of the dictatorship of the proletariat is actually different from the earlier dictatorship because this type of dictatorship provides for the first time in history and this actually means uh, not the control of a single solitary figure but it's a majority control. So, the word dictatorship has been misinterpreted by many thinkers later on as me and misunderstood by many and as i've already said the uh, in the in the in the real examples from the pages of the history whether it be the revolution in the russia or in the revolution in the china we can see uh, a form of dictatorship uh, we don't know whether uh, these were the dictatorship of the proletariat but we can surely contain that a, a form of dictatorship, a majoritarian government, uh, uh, a flavor of the majoritarian government uh, 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 was always there uh, in these Marxian governments. But what actually Marx said in his text is that the government of the proletarian dictatorship is far more democratic than other governments have been because this includes even the bourgeois democracy of the capitalism. So Marx actually talks about an inclusive governance. 
uh, he talks about the demon he even talks about the inclusion of the capitalist classes in this form of revolution in this form of governance later on so uh, for the time being uh, he said that the ruling system will work as an exploiting class the ruling system the rulers will be the exploited class for the time being because this purpose is not to continue permanently its own power but its main purpose is to eliminate oppression permanently so the main objective and aim of the dictatorship of the proletariat is to eliminate the conception of oppression from the face of the art permanently and for the elimination of the oppression for the abolition of the private property and for carrying out a program that will take society towards the perfect classless stateless communist society a careful use of the coercion or force is inevitable because marx thought that these capitalist people will uh, not let the proletariat people eventually to control all these means of the production they will eventually uh, uh, organize uh, uh, in and employ the state machinery and hence the coercion uh, uh, and in fact uh, uh, a form of resistance is inevitable on the part of the proletariat people in the early stages of the proletarian dictatorship but marx actually talks about an uh, inclusive governance and because at this time the strength of the remaining elements of the capitalist society will be greatest especially in terms of the numbers and influence of its ideology and hence uh, this coercion uh, uh, and there lies the importance of the coercion and hence to protest this strongly and boldly the power of the proletariat dictatorship must be employed marx said that with the end of the capitalism there will be only one class the proletariat and here one class means no class at all and a classless society will be formed and established so at this time only the state which was in the process of withering away from the time of the completion of the revolution will also disappear absolutely so the ultimate aim of the revolution of a communist revolution is to establish a classless society which will lead to the abolition of the state jekhane rashtrer ar kono proyojon porbe na ei jaygati amar antoto mone hoyeche je marx hoyto onektai utopian way te bhebechilen tar karon ta rashtrer proyojon kono din porbe na এই এটা একটা আমারই মনে হয় একটা অলমোস্ট একটা ইম্পসিবল ফ্যান্টাস ম্যাগোরিক ড্রিম বিকজ স্টেট মেশিনারি অ্যাকচুয়ালি মিনস আ লট অফ থিংস কারণ আমরা যদি টোয়েন্টি এথ সেঞ্চুরি সাইকোলজি সাইকোনালিসিস পড়ি তাহলে আমরা বুঝতে পারব অলমোস্ট ফ্রয়েড ইজ রাইটিং ফ্রয়েড ইজ কন্টেম্পোরারি অফ মার্কস অ্যান্ড দ্য সেম টাইম হি ইজ টকিং অ্যাবাউট দ্য ডাইনামিক মডেল অফ দ্য হিউম্যান মাইন্ড where he is dividing the human mind into three parts one is ego another is super ego and another is id id is the primeval is the container of the primeval instincts of the human mind uh, where uh, uh, the demonic impulses of the human mind is contained so manusher modde ta dano ta dano bota rape molestation uh, 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 destruction of the property এই এই ধরনের ইম্পালসগুলো মানুষের মধ্যে সবসময়ই থাকে এর ফলে এই দিজ মেশিনারিজ অফ দ্য জুডিশিয়ারি লেজিসলেটিভ মেশিনারি দ্য মেশিনারি অফ দ্য এক্সিকিউটিভ অ্যাডমিনিস্ট্রেশন এগুলোর প্রয়োজন হবে না কোনো দিন এটা একটা বলাটা প্রায় অসম্ভব রাষ্ট্রের প্রয়োজন হয়েছে বলেই অ্যাকর্ডিং টু দ্য কন্ট্রাক্টারিয়ান থিয়োরিস্ট মানুষ সোশ্যাল কন্ট্রাক্ট ক্রিয়েট করে সিভিলাইজেশন তৈরি করেছে সমাজ তৈরি করেছে পুলিশ ফোর্স তৈরি করেছে ফলে আমরা একদিন রাতারাতি একটা ক্লাসলেস সোসাইটিতে পরিণত হব এবং সেখানে দ্যাট উইল লিড ইভেন্টুয়ালি টু দ্য অ্যাবলিউশন অফ দ্য স্টেট এটা আমরা বারাবারই মনে হয়েছে ইজ এ নিউটোপিয়ান থিঙ্কিং অন দ্য পার্ট অফ দ্য মার্কস বাট অফকোর্স আ ডিপ ফিলোজফিক্যাল রিডিং অফ মার্কস ইজ পসিবল অ্যান্ড অফকোর্স দেয়ার আর সাম ভেরি ইম্পর্টেন্ট ফিলোজফিক্যাল ফাউন্ডেশনস বিহাইন্ড 
propounding this kind of conception of the abolition of the state or withering away the machineries of the state. So what is Marx's theory of the state according to the present state, not the uh, communist uh, state that Marx is predicting? So according to the Marxian theory of the state, state is an exploitative institution. It's an exploitative machinery and no state is evolved or born for the welfare of the people. No, it's not. The institution, like state, is but a means of ruling the influential upon the poor and the weak. Rashtra, Shabshamay, Jara Prabhab Shali, Tade Netti Tetoiri Hai, Emang Jara Weak, Jara Puritari People, Shorbohara, Tadero Pure Niyontron Kora Cheshta Kore. It's basically an institution which protects the interests of the minority people like capitalists and which exploits the majority class. According to Marx, the institution of the state is but a means of compulsion or an engine of tyranny. It's only an engine of tyranny. Kebol matro akna tantrik bhabe jodi kono rashtro ki uniyontron korte chaye, niyontron korte chawata hi hotche, rashtre akmatro mool lokho. And Marx, in his theory, talks about the disappearance of the state. He says that with the gradual disappearance of the class, the state which was which was in the process of withering away from the time of the completion of the revolution will also disappear completely. And then there will be no more thesis, no more antithesis and the class war. Marx also to some extent, uh, like Fukuyama, talked about the end of history. Uh, 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 though uh, he never pronounced these words, but there was the hint of it. Because Marx says the proletarian dictatorship will bring about social and economic justice, and hence there will be no need for the state. There will be no more thesis, no more antithesis, that is, no more progression of history, no more class work. One man will never exploit another man, one class will never exploit another class. In short, the necessary ground for the disappearance of the state will be created. So, withering away of the state is a Marxist concept, uh, first coined by Friedrich Engels. Here I uh, actually try to uh, summarize the entire outline of historical materialism. This has been collected from internet. I don't know the source of the book. But this is a very, uh, uh, what I would say, a very uh, uh, a concise way, through a very concise way, it talks about the outline of the historical materialism or Marx's foundation uh, of the conceptual history. So Marx says that the society can be divided into two parts. One is the base and another is the superstructure, substructure and superstructure. So base is basically the economic base uh, where uh, uh, there is the means of the production and relations of the production. Okay, and on the other hand, in the superstructure, there is the legal and the political system, the religious system, the cultural and the social practices, literature, painting, art, drama, all these things belongs to the superstructure portion. So, superstructure and then there is base, the substructure. And from the substructure originates the mode of the production. What is the mode of production? Mode of production can be divided into two. One is the forces of production and another is the relations of production. What is forces of production? Forces of production are the laborers, the proletariat class, the land, labor, capital, organization, all these things. And hence, forces of production can be divided into two parts. One is the means of production, land, labor, capital, organization, resources, tools, equipment, and then there is another is labor power, human knowledge and skill, which has been supplied by the proletariat, the most important power, the most important domain of the base. So according to Marx, this ba in this base belong the proletariat people, the labor class people. Of course, the capitalist also is controlling the these forces of production, they are seizing the forces of the production. So base is actually controlling everything. It's the foundation of the society. And from these forces of production, there occurs the relations of production. What is relations of production? It's an 
interdependent dynamics where the slave is actually uh, depending on the owner where the owner where the owner is also depending on the serf on the slave so relations of production actually uh, 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 is uh, creating a very uh, important uh, form of the progression of the history through these relations of the production history is being created because relations of production will eventually lead to the social formation formation of various forms of societies like the slave owning society the slave society then the feudal society and then the capitalist society in which marx is writing his texts and these social formations will eventually give birth to the contending classes like the master and the slave lord and the serf capitalist and worker they are in marxist terms created the dialectics in the society no conflict no revolution so these social formations ultimately uh, gave birth to the contending classes through which the progression of the history is being actualized so so through this outline of the historical materialism we can sum up marx's understanding of the society society is divided into base and superstructure base is the economic base superstructure is the cultural the legal the political superstructure where there is uh, religion theology morality social practices cultural practices art literature marx in throughout his whole life uh, do not give much grave importance to the superstructure super the importance of the superstructure has been emphasized by the post marxist from antonio gramsci onwards so marxist literary theory is basically about giving importance to the conception of the superstructure sorry and uh while uh, the modes of the production uh, uh, is part of the base the forces of production the relations of production will eventually give, give birth to the uh, social formations so this is the outline of the historical materialism uh now i will talk about some of the political aspects of marxism though uh, this is not very much important in your syllabus but you should know a little bit of it because uh, i think marxism is something to be applied because it's a very important social and political phenomena which remapped and reimagined the map of the europe uh, and as well as uh, the entire world in a completely different way so these historical incidents these historical happenings are very important for you first international what is first international it's basically a revolutionary organization which marx actually dreamed of a group of british workers uh, organized this first international in the freemasons hall it's an international organization perhaps the first international organization of the proletarian class and always remember marx actually visualized a uh, revolution a uh, proletarian revolution in terms of international scale never about uh, never he thought about uh, 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 the re revolution of the workers in a regional or in the in the national scale he thought about it international scale uni antarjatik bhabei bhebechilen je duniyar somosto exploited manush ek hobe ebong prithibir somosto joner government ke din phele debe ata mass revolt and uprising hobe marx seriously the believe for them and the international working men's association iwf often called the first international uh, which has been operative from 1864 to the 1876 it was an international organization which aimed at uniting a variety of different left wing socialist communist and even anarchist groups those who don't believe in the conception of the state jara noirajyabadi tara tader keo ekta jaygay uni anar chesta korechilen and it was founded in 1864 in a working men's meeting held in st martin's hall london first international marxist jibito kalei gote geche 
আরও ইম্পর্টেন্ট ঘটনা ইম্পর্টেন্ট ইনসিডেন্ট দ্য প্যারিস কমিউন দ্য ফার্স্ট রেভলিউশনারি গভর্নমেন্ট দ্য ফার্স্ট র্যাডিক্যাল সোশ্যালিস্ট রেভলিউশনারি গভর্নমেন্ট ইন দ্য হিস্ট্রি অফ দ্য ওয়ার্ল্ড হ্যাপেন্ড ইন প্যারিস এইটিন যেখানে ফ্র্যাঙ্কো ক্রুশিয়ান ওয়ার্ল্ড লেড টু দ্য ক্যাপচার অফ দ্য এম্পায়ার নেপোলিয়ন দ্য থার্ড ইন সেপ্টেম্বর which led to the collapse of the second french empire and also uh, it announces the beginning the inception of the third republic so you can see the picture where uh, a barricade of the rue voltaire after its capture by the regular army during the bloody week because paris was under siege for four months you know third republic workers besh koy jon worker ekta jaygay hoye ekta government form korechilo shei prothom চার মাসের জন্য ছোট্ট এক্সপেরিমেন্টাল গভর্নমেন্ট বাট ইতিহাসের নিরিখে খুবই ইম্পর্টেন্ট ঘটনা প্যারিস সময় সো অন দ্য সেকেন্ড অফ সেপ্টেম্বর এইটিন সেভেন্টি আফটার ফ্রান্স ইজ ডিফিট এট দ্য ব্যাটল অফ দ্য সিডেন ইন দ্য ফ্র্যাঙ্ক অর প্রুশিয়ান ওয়ার্ল্ড এম্পায়ার নেপোলিয়ন দ্য থার্ড সারেন্ডার টু দ্য প্রুশিয়ান চ্যান্সেলার অটো ভন দি স্মার্ট হোয়েন দ্য নিউজ রিচ দ্য প্যারিস নেক্সট ডে শক্ট অ্যান্ড অ্যাঙ্গি ক্রাউডস কেম আউট অফ দ্য স্ট্রিটস এম্প্রেস ইউজিন ডি মন্টিজিও the emperor's wife an acting regent at the time fled the city and the government of the second empire swiftly collapsed republican and radical deputies of the national assembly went to the honorable divine and proclaimed the new french republic and formed a government of national defense so that that, that can be described as the first working men's government in 1871 This is Mikhail Bakunin, a Russian revolutionary anarchist, considered as a major founder of the social anarchist tradition, uh, who participated in the international. And remember, Marx was a key figure in the General Council of the International, the first international, and argued for the use of the state to bring about socialism. But Bakunin was never interested in this form of state missionaries. and uh, there occurs a kind of rift between bakunin and marx uh, this picture uh, has been taken from introducing marxism a graphic guide by rupert woodfin i must uh, mention that uh, i have indebted uh, 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 greatly to this book introducing marxism a graphic guide by rupert woodfin it's a brilliant book i will send you the ebook uh, and uh, uh, through illustration it beautifully depicted a uh, marxism in a very simple way so bakunin says uh, in this uh, picture that i oppose capitalism capitalist exploitation but tyranny in general is the greater threat to the humanity and therefore opposed to any form of organization and marx says bakunin that geneva winbag is trying to capture the international and remake it in his own remake his own image to this way and there occurs a form of rift between marx and bakunin so uh, i will end now uh, classical marxism uh, by describing the various basic marxist principle that i have already discussed throughout the entire lecture so what i have discussed first historical materialism or the materialistic interpretation of history i have discussed with you what is dialectical materialism it's the combination and the resolution of the thesis and the antithesis into synthesis i have talked about the concept of the surplus value the concept of the class struggle a very important concept without which social revolution is not possible i have talked about the dictatorship of the proletariat and of course the complete withering away and disappearance of the state i have talked about marx's view of the religion where marx says it's the opium of the people I have talked about the establishment of the communist society and the concept of the freedom in Marxist theory. I have discussed with you the theory of revolution and the philosophy of state according to the Marxist principle. So this is, uh, we can say that uh, the basic principles of the classical Marxism. From the next lecture onwards, I will discuss about uh, the basic principles. of marxist literary theory and how actually marx himself reacted to this theory and how eventually uh, it will lead to the post marxism but before that 
I will also discuss Leninism, Stalinism and Maoism in short because these historical occurrences are very important though not directly related to your syllabus. But classical Marxism is very much important because without understanding the foundations of Marxism you will never be able to understand Marxist literary criticism. And uh, I think uh, base and superstructure, ideology, these things are also very important for your examination also. Uh, the classical Marxist thinking. So uh, from the next lecture onward, I'll move into the basic tenets of the Marxist criticism and then we'll ponder on the, uh, on the actual application of Marxism in the state politics by leaders like Lenin, Stalin and Mao. And then we'll again come back into uh, the post-Marxist thinking uh, propagated first by uh, Antonio Gramsci. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you for listening to the lecture. Uh, we'll see you in the next class.